Hello and welcome. My name is Lenora Morrow Jeffcoat. I am a proud Winthrop University alumnus, uh, class of 2001, with degrees in organ performance from Dr. David Lowry. We recorded this interview in uh, February of 2024. We're quite excited to have discussed with Dr. Lowry the many facets of his wonderful and storied career. And a lot of that we wanted to share with you in the Winthrop University archives. I'm particularly indebted to my fellow Winthrop alums, uh, Shirley Fishburne and Debbie Bagwell-Bauer, also Oregon students of Dr. Lowry's, and also to the wonderful IT folks here at Shandon Methodist Church here in Columbia, South Carolina. We hope you enjoy these interviews and may Winthrop ever stand. We're very, very excited to hear what you have to share with us. Um, at the outset, I wanted you to just talk with us a bit about your formative years. When did you get started? When did you know that the organ would be your chosen profession? Just start at the beginning and maybe take us from your childhood on through um, to Baldwin Wallace and how that was important in your music study. Huh. Well, when I was in Oak Hill, West Virginia, after the Second World War, we, we lived in New York during the war and then went back to West Virginia. Um, at the Presbyterian Church, a very nice lady who played the grandma's parlor organ uh, there. I, in second grade, I would always walk up to the pump organ and watch her play the post flute. And uh, so it was later in the second grade that I started piano lessons, which was right down the street from our house at the Episcopal Church where the piano teacher used the parish hall there for a, for a teaching studio. So it was it was all very convenient. Long story short, we by the seventh grade, we had moved to Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, I got a really good piano teacher there uh, who made me blossom on a number of things about playing the piano and playing the scales in every key and all that. Eighth grade, I started taking organ lessons next door to my junior high school uh, at First Baptist, um, where um, uh, you know I was introduced to this big culture organ. Uh, then went okay, but there was a new Aeolian Skinner that had just been installed at First Presbyterian, and that teacher at First Baptist said, "You need to go uptown to uh, First Pres." And and got in real off course, uh, who made first of all he made me put my shoes on, <laughs> and uh, uh, I had to do pedal exercises, and uh, uh, so everything started working very well there. the The other interesting thing about Asheville uh, was that in my senior year, when I didn't have to, the only thing I had to take was English, and so I volunteered to take first year Latin and typing. Thank goodness, because I can still type like a fury without looking at the keyboard. Um, the uh, I got hired by uh, an organ company who was rebuilding the Central Methodist organ. So I learned all about tuning pipes, fixing reed pipes, uh, re-leathering pouches, uh, the, the tuning the whole bit. Um, uh, and then I, the... Aileen's Kenna was right across the street at First Presbyterian. So when I was through working two or three hours every afternoon for the organ company, I would walk across the street to the Skinner and uh, practice. Meanwhile, I had done all sorts of things in junior high. I, I substituted for the band director at the junior high school because she was out with ear surgery. And at that point, I was playing oboe. And the, these teeth and the oboe reed did not get along at all. Uh, but I had to take, for about six weeks, I was conducting the band rehearsal every day uh, because she wasn't there and there was nobody else in town that was could do it. So there, there I was with my classmates, uh, making them play in time and in tune. Uh, and uh, But I switched to trombone. That didn't work with his teeth either, uh, so I um, I did switch eventually to tuba, uh, which in those days was a sousaphone. After the war, schools couldn't afford to go out and buy good tubas. Um, 
but so so I had to be at football games every Friday night in sub freezing weather. Um, I swore in my junior year I'd never go to a football game again, and I have. Right. But I didn't win first chair all state band we on playing tuba of uh, the sousaphones and mm-hmm. um and in those days there were no interstates to get from Asheville to chapel hill nevertheless lots of lots of ensemble stuff was taking place mm-hmm. there was there was a daughter of a congregationalist minister in Asheville who was a voice major at baltimore and she came down i knew the the minister and he got me to play piano for her to sing some things in some sort of a thing at the Congregational Church. And she gave me a big lecture about why I needed to go to Baldwin Wallace. The, the famous name Will Headley, Will O. Headley, uh, who was in Syracuse for you know, He'd just gotten out of the Army, and he was from Asheville. So my organ teacher got him to run a tape recorder. <laughs> The old-fashioned type of tape recorder uh, of, of me playing uh, three pieces to send to Baldwin Wallace. And in 1956, I won a scholarship for $750, which was divided up into four years. And it, it, it didn't cost much to go to college in the in the. In the 1950s, let me tell you. Uh, uh, so I, I got to Cleveland uh, at Baldwin Wallace. BW was was a great experience. One, you know, that's the home of the oldest Bach festival in the United States. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I learned how to sing bass in all of the major works and cantatas and um uh, and listening to lots of lots of Bach things going on, uh, and the teacher that I had from sophomore year to senior Warren Behrman was terrific. Um, I played Bruce Heidel's. I got a job at the one of the Episcopal churches in um, Cleveland uh, on a C three Hammond, <laughs> but the the priest was a good baritone, and he always sang in the offertory anthem every Sunday in the choir of, of uh, eight or nine people. Um, so I, I've learned a lot about uh, about all that. He told me, he said, I don't care that you're a Presbyterian, but you have to come to confirmation class so I, you can be sure that you're saying the right things to the junior choir. Ah, yeah. Well, at the end of confirmation class, it's... I was standing in front of the bishop getting confirmed as an Episcopalian. Um, been there ever since. Ever since. Uh, and, uh, but the big thing for me, really, about not just BW, but being in Cleveland, was that I somehow or another got, a, somebody urged me to do this, and I did it. I had a season ticket to the Cleveland Orchestra every Saturday night that they they played. And that was George Sell and Robert Shaw. Mm-hmm. And I learned more sitting in Severance Hall than I did in any class mm-hmm. in college. I just it was fantastic experience me being there. And it was it was a long bus ride to get from Severance Hall in downtown and then down to Berea. Uh but uh Where? It, it's not that way now. You can go go on a train, but you couldn't then. Uh, Old Stone Church downtown, but I, I did take some organ lessons with the organist there during the summers, um, and uh, and was a big molar. He got Charlotte Garden to come play a recital, and I just fell in love with Charlotte Garden. Uh, she was terrific. I played a piece for her, and at the end of master class, and uh, I thought, oh. This is worth going to New York, to Union Seminary, to have her as a teacher. And that worked out very well. Um, uh, the, um, and then, right, it turned out that I was invited to play a recital at the St. Thomas Fifth Avenue uh, in the spring of um, that first year at Union. What year was that? <laughs> They would have been 61. 
spring of 61. And uh, the, uh, and she was the, the West Point Cadet Chapel Choir sang before even song that, uh, they sang even song that day. And I played the recital for 30 minutes before, before that. And uh, I remember that I played the uh, Deus to our Militum of Sowerby, which was a brand new piece in those days. And Fred Swan played it and Alec Whiten played it. What I didn't know was, I was very proud to have learned the piece and it was perfect for that organ. Charlie Garden was sitting in the back pew. What I didn't know was that Francis Jackson was in town <laughs> and he was visiting... Alec Whiten at the cathedral, Alec handed him the score to the Sowerby and the recording that he had just made for on the, for Aeolian Skinner. Uh, so I had no idea when I was playing the piece that, that, that Jackson was sitting in the church looking at the score while I was playing. It was a good thing I didn't know. But there was a reception at Bill Self's apartment afterwards, and and he was there, Charlotte Garvin was there, Bob Baker was there. Um, the guy who formed the AGO. It was it was great fun. Well, Charlotte Carden was killed in the motor crash that following Friday. And I turned pages for Bob Bob Baker in out in New Jersey to for her funeral. Um and uh it, it was wild because the, that funeral was on the same day of that I was in charge of a wedding to James Chapel at the seminary and Jerry Hancock was playing the wedding. I was conducting the choir in the rear of the thing and and, and, and Judy Hancock, and she wasn't Hancock then. Uh, they weren't married yet. Um, she was in that choir. Uh, that, that, that was a ball. So you, the car that took me back into Manhattan was <laughs> Vernon Dattar driving the car uh, from the funeral. So it was, it was wild. But Bob Baker had been appointed the head of Union Seminary and the School of Sacred Music at that point, and he got Donald McDonald to come to, to Union to teach me and one other student. So, okay. uh, so, so I finished there. One of the things that Charlotte said to me uh, during the spring, uh, bef before all of the, you know, and it was sort of mid spring, we were sitting. We were standing out on the street between seminary and Riverside Church. She had just been in Riverside Church asking Fred Swan about some lighting fixtures that she was concerned about in, at her church in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And he was showing her some things, and she came back out and, and said she had learned something. And then the, the, she gave me a little bit of a lecture and said, the, in, in you need to stay here in the city. There is a future for you here, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, would, I had five jobs. Right. One in the summer in North Carolina and four in, in, uh, in New York City. And uh, it's uh, there, it, there was no money in the bank. I couldn't, I couldn't buy tickets to go to any shows or anything. That was, uh, money was impossible. The church job I had when, uh, during seminary was out in New Jersey and Episcopal Church in uh, West Inglewood, which is part of Teaneck. Uh, uh, and one of the choir members there who was the chair of the committee, he and his wife retired to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and they built a house. And he called me when I was working up at Unto These Hills in Cherokee. He called me and said, I just found out that there's a fabulous organ at the at college here in town. And he said, I figured out that you can come, and he already had a date and everything else to come and play that organ, and we'll invite people to come in, uh, and you'll enjoy it. Well, so I did. And uh, you enjoyed it. And, and I enjoyed it, and there, there were about 10 people sitting in Burns Auditorium. And uh, as I remember, the positive division of the organ didn't work at that point because the bellows had collapsed or something and it hadn't been fixed. Um, but that, that was a fun experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Jess Casey wasn't there. He was at the beach. But the secretary that was, I can't remember the secretary's name. She was, uh, she was there. She was ready to retire. She uh, managed the whole thing about me being in there 
Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was the following summer that the, uh, whoever my immediate predecessor was, it went through, uh, quit. Mm-hmm. The, that secretary said to Jess Casey, you need to look at that. That's it for David Lowry. Well, okay. <laughs> well, it, affirmative action hadn't taken place quite yet. It was, it was that 64, I think, when affirmative action right. started. But I was with a placement agency in Chicago who couldn't do that sort of thing. It's illegal, but now you can't do that anymore. Right. And uh, uh, and they had the information. Okay. And so I wound up traveling down from Cherokee to uh, uh, Rock Hill, and I played for him. I had just traded cars uh, because I, I had a Mercury, which I loved, but I couldn't park outside of, it, it took, it, I lived on East 82nd Street between First and New York, and parking was always a problem because the, that Mercury was always three or four inches too long to get into the parking bus, you know. And it, so I traded in on the BW, the v, v, VW Beetle. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and in those days, you had an option as to whether you wanted to put air conditioning in or not. And of course, I took that book and living in New York, I don't need an air conditioner in a car. So I didn't get an air conditioner. And so, so, so then I get, so the, the day that I went down to, to meet Jess Casey at, at uh, Winthrop, it was a day off on Monday. I had to stop at that little shopping center near the college uh, and get a new shirt because I, I was dripping wet. It was 95 <laughs> degrees in Rock Hill. And, uh, there, but, and was a, I had the lid open to the top of the, <laughs> the beetle. Wow. Uh, but Jess called me on Wednesday at Cherokee. He said, you need to be here Friday morning. I know you have to be back at Cherokee, but you need to be here Friday morning as the president wants to hear you. And talk to you. So, what was his name? Joe Davis. Yeah, Charlie Davis. Davis. Charlie Davis from Alabama. Yes, sir. Yes, with the, with all of those lovely accents that he had. <laughs> uh, the job was advertised for sixty five hundred dollars to be college organist. That was the name of the of the, uh, the college organist, right? It was the, in terms of Things it wasn't professor it was uh, it was instructor uh, and college organist title. Um, well, I did get in there. And I took somebody with me from Cherokee down in the Beetle, and then the, the, got down there and I played. And uh, uh, after I was through playing, Charlie Davis sat back in Burns Auditorium and said, "Give him sixty-eight. <laughs> so, so I got free on a three hundred dollar raise, right, 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 right there, I'm, uh, and uh, <laughs> which was great fun, uh, and uh, so I, that's how we got started. Okay, yeah. Uh, one of the things that one of you said, and something or another, uh, said, did, did, "Did I ever feel like Viv Alby going to all cool. girls do do an all girls school?" Uh, I have to confess that what that didn't concern me, but cons- what I was very enticed about was the fact of that Aeolian Skinner was there, and I very much wanted to be a part of it. Right. Um, and uh, and by that time, the thing had been fixed. I don't really don't remember what I played because at Cherokee, I was playing a, a recital on the the big Hammond organ with the full pedal board and the thirty twos and all that stuff. At the theater, I was playing a, a twenty or twenty-five minute program every night before each show. Right. So I was playing a, a lot of literature. I think, as, as you know, there were four very fun and organ majors in that very who were freshmen when I walked in. Right. Um, uh, Hazel, Hazel. Hazel, Bales. Hazel Bales, and Diane Vermillion, Diane Spate, and Clara. Dobbins. <laughs> um, 
uh, were all there. And they all started working very hard, very quickly. But And there were a couple of but Janet Bowen's sister, Phyllis, uh, was a junior at that point. So I had to see her if it were junior and a senior recital. Um, oh, there were... Uh, there's a list down here. I won't need to look at it, but, um, it, you know, it, it was a challenge mm -hmm. uh, because there were some really good students. Right. And, uh, in those days, we could use the auditorium until 11 o'clock at night. I mean, nothing else was going on in Burns except you organists were, were there all the time. Right. It ain't that way anymore. But, no, it's not. Uh, like me, um, uh, so that, that that was that was all very good. Right. I had to teach music a pre music appreciation. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you that. Like a hundred here, a hundred and fifty people over in the, the, the Tillman Auditorium. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. Um, well, but uh, I, but at least at least they always provided me with one of you all as on scholarship to uh, oh. help me grade papers and keep a roll and all that sort of stuff. So it was conducting. I was conducting a was it Benjamin Britton uh, and a uh, treble piece uh, the ceremony ceremony mm -hmm. but then it was it and when I turned to the last page of the thing <laughs> there was no music on the last page or there was an obscene picture on the last page <laughs> and that be, okay, they did uh I, I think Janet was in the chorus at that point. They all kept a straight face, knowing darn good and well what they had just done. And we finished the, the whole piece. I kept a copy of that for a long time. Uh, yeah. I don't think I have it anymore. I do have a, a list here that that it, it, I calculated after you posed that question a few weeks ago. Right. Uh, the, I, I found 80 names right. mm -hmm. uh, over, over oh. years, 47 years. Mm -hmm. Now, it, whether they were majors or minors, I, I didn't try to right. divide yeah. that. What is really, and I'm very proud of the fact that that good 40, 35 to 40 of them uh, have gone to major jobs mm -hmm. uh, around the United States. Now, not all of them are Winthrop students because I, you know, I'm the one who, Got John Chapel Stowe going yeah. as as an organist, and he became head onto of a university. The significant change in my approach to how to play the organ happened when I in '67 when I went to Harlem and uh, Holland on the Bavo Kirk organ. Uh, but then I uh, studied with Corquet and Anton Heiler. And uh, Heiler will be up about a heck of a lot about what it means. Well, does he, you know, Bach expert, complete recordings of the complete works of Bach and everything else. Uh, but he was very practical about the fact that, yes, you got to him. There are certain techniques in playing Baroque music on the organ, but you have to mold those techniques for the immense variety of organs that are being built in the 20th century, all of which, well, they're obviously not Baroque instruments anymore, but some imitate Baroque instruments, others don't. And of course, there are, again, the American classic organ, G. Donald Harrison, is one of those things that's bridges of the gap uh, in there and uh, how to play and what, and what kind of acoustics to play in and all that. It, it woke me up to a heck of a lot. Right. Then the Don Willing at, uh, at North Texas, uh, we agreed about a lot of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I played, I played one of my recitals for, for doctorate at a big tracker in uh, Dallas uh, in a Lutheran church. Uh, and then the, uh, the two on that molar, which thank goodness I think has been rebuilt now, um, in in the auditorium, which was nasty. And uh, 
Uh, and then my lecture recital was on another tracker and then in, in another auditorium at the, at the university on, on then that was on early music. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way, one of you all said, what was your favorite instrument or something you know, like that? Uh, Tell us. And that um, <laughs> there isn't a favorite instrument, but Bavo, Kirk, and Harlan. Right. I, you, you, you know, I was sitting there playing, and, and, and I think I, was, I played the B minor prelude and fugue on that with Heiler in the class there. And, and it was very interesting playing that piece, knowing that Wolfgang Mozart sat on the same bench at age 10 and played the same organ that I was playing then. Uh, I mean, I mean, that, that, and that is a fabulous instrument. Oh, yeah. uh, but then St. Thomas Fifth Avenue is a fabulous instrument. Um, it's no longer there. It's a new instrument now, which I haven't heard in person or seen. Uh, but that G. Donald Harrison was involved in that. But that wasn't, he was rebuilding the Naolians, the, the, the Ernest Skinner organ that was there. And that's the the thing that I love most about Bunchrip is that that's not a rebuild of a previous instrument. It's entirely T. Daughter Harrison mm -hmm. and Letourneau and I have always agreed that it has to say that. Say that way. Every situation is totally different. Right. Um, and you have to, if you're rebuilding an instrument there and not making any major improvements in it, then you've got to consider what did the original builder do and how kind of you can make it work right. better, which changes your mind about a lot of things. If you have the opportunity to throw out some stops and add some divisions, then you you do something else. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, and of course, for there was a period of time when I represented and sold, I think, six or seven Gabriel Nave organs, um, because I think he was always a very fine builder. Um, and to Christchurch, Charlotte is just a very, very fine instrument, uh, as is the one in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, at that Roman Catholic uh, thing that's, it was, I had been in Europe, and I came back, and Gabriel said, you have to come to St. Paul with, to see this organ that we're putting in. Mm -hmm. And that's where Andrew Haler was then working for... Uh, uh, Gabriel May, and um, they had just decided that Andrew wasn't going to continue working anymore. And I told Andrew, I said, "Well, if you're here, the unit, you know, you might as well see a little bit of the United States rather than just St. Paul and, and London, Canada." Uh, <laughs> so he came down to Winthrop, and after two two or three days of visiting with a fellow organ students, uh, he said, "Can I?" stay here and get a degree well yeah he, he did yes. uh, and uh, by the way he's just been elected to be suffragan bishop in, in the anglican church so he's not confirmed yet but uh, that's that's going to be maybe almost a year away but the election has taken place for him to be on that so um uh, and he's still in the Navy mm -hmm. in, in Okinawa, of all places. A few feet away from where we're sitting right now um, <laughs> is a remarkable combination of uh, work by Daniel Angerstein uh, after the Moeller Company uh, died. You remember that this instrument here uh, was in the shop in Hagerstown. And this church had to go had to go up there and move it themselves to come down here because Moeller had ceased to exist. Right. Okay. That's item one. But now this instrument yeah. is this instrument is is uh, has some electronic fins in it. And that works. And uh, and that's okay. Not much sure. <laughs> My my dear, and, and that I, I'm still confused by it. I mean, the, the Walker Company electronic people seem to be doing a really nice job. And sometimes, if it's a matter of having an honest to goodness uh, 16 foot principal sound or 32, uh, I mean, because there's no space to have those kind of pipes 
in an organ. That has historically has been, uh, in the last 20, 30 years, has been successful. Mm -hmm. um, so I get confused about, there, there's a, uh, you know, I have a website with the, yeah. your chapter of the AGO, yes. uh, and uh, uh, the one in, is it Sumter? The big, the big Methodist church. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, the Rota Rooter, the Rota Organ. Uh, this year, I, I played Jimmy Erlong's wedding there. Yes. Uh, and uh, it was all pipes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That I went down there to, to see what on earth they had done. But Rogers uh, put in this mammoth console and went in there. All of the Reuter is still there, mm -hmm. but twice as many stops it was in the road are now on that organ there, and some, I mean, both, two thirds of the thing is now Rogers Electronics, okay. and one third of it is pipes. So and I, it, it was very confusing. Confusing. Some of the sounds, I thought, oh God, they will never, never, ever use that sound. Um, uh, it's just a uh, windblown pipes right. still make okay. the best sound. Yes. That was 1955 <laughs> right. uh, when he was there, and I didn't think the job was six and five. Hot, got it. Um, but then, of course, I, you know, we hosted piles of right. first-class people all the way through this. Right. Uh, who, are, who are some of those people? Well, well it's kind of impressed. <laughs> and then, but, uh, uh, the hands-on Heiler and... Uh, um, um, or the, the, the list goes on. Right. Um, which was uh, always a great joy. Right. Uh, the Catherine Crozier, mm -hmm. twice when right. she was there. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but remember, you remember Catherine Crozier. Uh, I've had two stories on her. Uh, the, the, I didn't, I wasn't there from the first time she played. Jess Casey had not here, but then he got her back the second time, and I was very much in charge of her. And uh, she always played from memory. Yes. Because she married Harold Gleason, you know. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was 30 years older than she was when when she graduated as a senior from the Eastman, he married her. Um, and, uh, but we were in the, uh, one of the rooms across the hall in the, in the School of Music. Um, and all of, all of what she was playing, the music was in a stack. And, she said, as we were, boy, she said, the, the door will be locked. Yes, thank you. I it will be locked. She says, she says, I just need, my mind needs to know exactly where the music is mm -hmm. while I'm playing. So there, the stack was there, right. and she went out, and she played perfectly, with missing no notes whatsoever, but she knew where the music yes. was. <laughs> now, that, that, that was. That was really important. The other calf and crochet thing that, that was great fun for me was uh, in, in Harlem, Holland, mm -hmm. on the Vava Kirk. Yes. She was playing a recital while I was there, and she had two people up there doing, pulling all the stops, there. right? Not turning pages, <laughs> although she did have the music on the rack so that the to, so that the stop pullers knew wh where she wanted things and, and how it was marked. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sitting out in the nave of that fabulous church, and Harold Gleason was sitting right beside me, and it was, we had little whispered conversations while things were going on, and all of a sudden. Catherine stopped and made, she made this big retard in the middle of Pascalia as she was instructing somebody to do it. And Carol said, now, Catherine, you know better than that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, she never wins. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, oh dear. Wow. But yes, uh, you, having great artists coming into the organ at Winthrop has always been Great. Well, without getting into too much of why it's in the state it's in, talk to us about ongoing care. What What are your concerns for the instrument? What would you advise the leaders at Winthrop to do as far as caring for the instrument moving forward? Um, what would be 
what would be an outline for proper care of such a historic instrument moving forward and preserving it? It's the only open metal 32-foot stop in South Carolina. I mean, bottom C is still there. It goes up 26 feet or so, and that brought his way to get to 32. Uh, uh, it's there. It's still in the chamber. It's, and quite, it's quite thrilling to see. Yeah, that was something I'm uh, sure you've got. There ain't another one in South Carolina. There no, there's some electronics, but there, <laughs> but not, a, not an open 32. And uh, Steve, uh, who's in? Who's in um, New Orleans? Blackman. Blackman, yes. At, uh, at, uh, but names aren't coming up. The famous avenue in in uh, New Orleans, Pre the Presbyterian. The big Presbyterian. Church. Yeah, there's a yeah. Presbyterian uh, church. Well, the Torno is building a new organ for him. Okay. That, that should be coming in next year, I think. Right. And... Uh, and since Luterno did the restoration at Winthrop mm -hmm. uh, back in 2007 or whatever it was, um, the, uh, it's, it's worked out very well for him to do the New Orleans thing. And one of the, one of the big thrills was that he made one change to what Luterno wanted to do. He said, I want, because of Winthrop, I want the thirty-two foot reed to be in the swell box. Ah, and Luterno agreed, yeah. and they put, and so the thirty-two foot reed is going in the swell box, yeah. which I think is one of the genius things about T. Allen Harrison's Winthrop instrument is that in that room, in those acoustics, uh, and with the sound that the thing makes, uh, having that thirty-two inside the swell box, you can do all sorts of combinations that you can't. Do if he were a bombard sitting there. Right. He was in the first class of men when when we went co-ed to get, and he came to uh, evening uh, the even song that I made my service playing class do over in the no longer existing Episcopal Chapel mm -hmm. on off campus behind Oakland Avenue Press, um, and, and he came over. He's from Shirol, Shirol, different, uh, and. Uh, or uh, in Methodist background, and he stood there. I don't know if he was chasing one of the girls. I don't know why he was there, but he was a freshman, and he stood there, and he said afterwards, I didn't know that the churches did things like that. And I, was, I mean, the girls did a beautiful job uh, doing what they were supposed to do with Grandma's parlor organ and the, the canticles and all that. Um, well, he started going to Our Savior, Rock Hill, and four years later, our Savior was sending him off to seminary to be a priest. Mm -hmm. And it just, the way things happen, uh, and I've been working for him now for 26 years here in uh, uh, in Columbia. One of our distinguished graduates had put in $100,000 for uh, for recitalists. Right. And, uh, and that's, it takes that kind of, of support mm -hmm. in there, and uh, there is, always helpful. there is, uh, in my will, there is uh, in something going to all that is. <laughs> I mean, if something happens to that organ, if my will is being changed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's got to be that that kind of thing. But I think nationally, there's not enough recognition about the thing. I've, I've joined a couple of Facebook organ. Mm -hmm. Things in G.W. Harrison discussion rooms right. and all that sort of stuff. Uh, remembering, remembering that 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 the organ is being put back together and that we are keeping it. And Lutordo is going to be involved in uh, in coming back. They're going to take care of the reed stops of cleaning each reed. Uh, all that Stephen is having to wash every pipe in water uh, because of the chemicals that the phone that put out the fire was doing. One of the other interesting things is that when I was a senior, so when I just graduated from high school in 56, uh, some relations to the people, the organ people that had hired me to, when I learned things about the organ, right. they took me to the AGO National Convention in New York City. Uh, 
So I heard Kosherville play the first recital on St. Thomas Fifth Avenue. Harrison died three weeks before that recital, oh. right around the corner in the apartment where he was staying mm -hmm. there in, in mid, mid uh, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a remarkable occasion. It was also the first, it was the, there was a Dorfley piece that was on the program, and Koshiro changed it to in order to play the the brand new Dorfley piece, which was the uh, on the on the premium view on the name of Alan. Yeah, so wow. I was sitting right there, wow. uh, and uh, <laughs> so uh, you know all, all those things had gone together, you know, right. and and what is meant by American classic organ. I, I don't know what kind of a role I can play, but somehow or another. Uh, the presence of that instrument, if it's in, to, indeed being put back uh, properly, right. uh, has got to receive some national attention. Right, absolutely. I mean, there are two major recordings that have been made on the instrument. I would certainly applaud that and, and be b way behind it if I were in charge of anything. I'm not. You're right. Uh, and it's, so it's up to the administration of what's going on and the faculty that's there as to whether anybody's going to get interested in doing it. Mm -hmm. But it coming if from a uh, mm -hmm. uh coming in it perhaps right. uh, there's some encouragement could be done but it, even if it's just down to you know taking a full week in the summertime for right. for to sponsor something or another about how to get uh an aago or a cago or whatever right. you know um uh, okay. because um a it's hard to tell. I just don't know what the administration is right. like and and what's going on. But but it, that's going to take a lot of alumni uh, backing, backing right. to be able to do that. Your career as a church musician spanned more than seven decades. Um, what changes have you seen in church music over these years? And um, what challenges do you see for the future um, for church musicians? First item, I've been very lucky. I have not had to deal with clergy or congregations that decided that what they want to do is put on a show with rock and roll bands and movie screens. I have not been close to anything like that. We, I've, I have always worked in a situation where you're supposed to do, and well, and, and, and as you know, in uh, almost entirely Episcopal churches, um, the... Uh, uh, and the one reason I left one Presbyterian church, but I was very happy with the choir and with the organ, uh, was because I never knew what the scripture reading was going to be, one scripture reading, uh, and what the, what the hymns were going to be until the Wednesday before that Sunday I would come in for rehearsal. And that would be the first time. Well, you know, I've been planning anthems for weeks ahead of time and training the choir. What happens if the anthem doesn't go with the lesson? Nobody cared, um, and there were only well, there were only four sermons that got rewritten all the time, and I I I quit. Right, uh, but I've been very lucky uh, not to have to deal with that. But the colleagues, student, former students, uh, situations that I keep observing, uh, churches are lots of churches are in a big mess. First of all, they can't function without a congregation because congregation, the, the, the word is it, it has to be spelled out as M-O-N-E-Y. Uh, if you ain't got money, you can't do it. Um, and so you've got to have a congregation that, that is going to produce the money to make it work, um, to heck with being religious. <laughs> is it, you know, let's do a rock and roll band, but that'll get people in. Well, and that's, not my idea of how you spread the gospel. And I am not on board with all of that. The trouble with about my having been in a seminary was I had to go to the same classes that the seminarians had to go to. Uh, and uh, sometimes I think I knew more about the Bible than I ever wanted to know, and maybe I know too much. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, so the culture is different. I, 
I'm really an old fuddy-duddy, and I'm not going to change. I'm uh, too old to change. Uh, I'm going to do what's there, but I'm perfectly open to what is going on in the 20th and the 21st centuries in terms of how music is produced and how you uh, you do it. But it's got to be within the integrity of what the church is supposed to be about. Um, it's a, I think it's a real problem for for some people. Um, there's an instance uh, locally where uh, a very fine musician from another church is coming to our church on Wednesdays for the noon service in the chapel because the church he's in, they're serving communion the little plastic cups that you have to peel the thing off of, and the bread is in a plastic bag, which you have to open in order to have it out. Uh, it's just, it's just, what's wrong with the body and blood of Christ? Oh, uh, you know, it's so, it's those kinds of things which annoy the heck out of a lot of people, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so those kind of changes, and maybe all this will work itself out in another decade. Right? right. Who knows? Right. Uh, but what are they teaching clergy in seminaries? Uh, how concerned are they? Uh, the, the lots of questions about that. My job has been in, in the situation I'm in now, and then previously in Rock Hill, and all that is that I choose hymns according to what the lessons of the day are. It's my responsibility that the hymns go with what is being preached. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's a change, the, in the, the clergy is, in each case, has always been smart enough to say, I'm, I want to emphasize this mm -hmm. on this Sunday. Let's plan on that. I was just thinking yesterday, uh, the, I had 14 of my 16 singers were there yesterday. Um, and uh, and I pay most of them. Uh, but I didn't stop to tell them where to carry over phrases with the punctuation of the hymn. They did it automatically, which helped me play the organ better because they were singing the phrases the way the English language was, was going. Um, it doesn't take long to train people to do that. Now, whether that is really getting the message across to the congregation, I don't know, but at least we're doing the right thing to, to be able to lead them. I remember Lorraine Gorell sitting in my living room on Milton, uh, and somebody else about, well, there had been a choral organization in town of some sort, but it, it had flunked or something. I, I don't know. There was a big discussion about that. Um, Anyhow, we did get started. It, well, let me back up. That having been through all of this stuff, uh, it's obvious that music is the most important thing in my life. That's that's it. Okay, nothing surpasses music. Uh, and you can put the word love in there anywhere you want to put it. But I'm married to music. Uh, the idea of leading people who are not musicians into music and giving them an experience that they're never going to forget, I think is really, really important. And while I've not always been able to articulate things that way, that's basically where I've always been, uh, which is why choral music and it's to some extent, uh, some instrumental music too, since I have had an orchestra from time to time. Um, the uh, uh, it's, I think it's really important that the choral music it is top of the list as a musician uh, to introduce people to an experience that they couldn't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, there is a piece. I'm, I'm just thinking of the choral society. We were singing three even songs and one mass at National Cathedral. Um, and uh, in York, South Carolina, there was a member of the House of Representatives. Um, I think he's deceased now. Spratt. Spratt. 
Right. He was in Washington, and he got us into the Capitol and in that fabulous room where, the, the, where everything takes place. <laughs> uh, and there we went in, and uh, we, we can sing. Well, you know, uh, it, it was... Uh, I've forgotten there's a soprano solo in the thing. Um, Motet. Uh, it's, well, the uh, Salt Lake City composer. Um, how can I keep from singing uh, a range of it that, that we did? Uh, and it, it, to sing that in that space, I mean, it was so meaningful to everybody that was there. Only music could have taken you to where you were going with that. I mean, this is one of the. And then at National Cathedral, uh, we were warned that for the mass on Sunday morning, that we had to go around back to enter. We couldn't come in the front door of the cathedral because there would be a military guard at the door and the, the traffic and all that sort of stuff because the celebrant of the mass was the new bishop uh, of Massachusetts uh, or whatever state in New England, uh, who was gay. Oh, Robinson. Uh, Robinson was the, was, well, we got there. We, we followed the instructions about what door to go in. Military was not at the front door. Uh, there was no, <laughs> there was no problem about the gay bishop for the first time ever, uh, or at least a known gay bishop, we all know that there have been gay bishops. Which uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the it was, but we participated in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And music again, what we were contributing just meant so much mm -hmm. uh, because we knew that we were offering something that we couldn't have done without music. I think that most of the leaders. Of that, including the new leaders at, uh, at uh, York County Choral Society, as well as uh, a number of the organizations we've got here in Columbia. I think they all have that, that same thing, that this is an experience that, uh, uh, that you can't have otherwise. Uh, Jed Johnson at the cathedral here developed a basic choir school uh, of boys and girls, and he's changed the lives of dozens of people growing up well, and yeah, there are some people at the cathedral who are saying, oh, why do the kids have to sing that flousy music all the time? They want, why can't the kids sing what kids want to sing? Well, guess what? They'd rather sing Stanford or Britain to, because they know what it means to be able to read well, to prepare well, to sing well, uh, and that sort of thing. It's just incredible what's going on. Mm -hmm. Kick. My GP doctor here in town that I've had for 25 years said the reason you're the age you are is because your office is on the second floor at the church. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's true. I go Thank up you. and down those yeah. darn steps uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, 20 letters. Years. And uh, 26, 26 years. years. Yeah. 26 years. Uh, and it's only been in the last two years that I've had this during Cain, uh, which I now trust implicitly. Mm -hmm. uh, and recently, both eyes have had cataract surgery. Right. Uh, I can now, for the first time ever at 86 years, uh, the lens that he put in inside my eyes, I can see the music on the rack absolutely perfectly. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's amazing how many notes I can read. I mean, but, but glasses didn't do it. I didn't see everything all, all the time. And without it, I'm, I'm looking at it, and I see de details that I had never seen before on a piece of paper. Now, looking at you now, you're a little out of focus because I've, these lenses are good uh, to about 30 inches or so. Everything gets a little blurred there, but I put my glasses on, and I've got 20-20 vision that I've never, ever had. Mm -hmm. With glasses or contact lenses, they, they, they've never worked that way. And I, now I can count leaves on a tree three blocks away. Um, I'd, I'd tell you it's uh, 86. 
<laughs> you have a new lease I, I mean, I have a new lease on one yeah. because I can see what's going on. I confess that I haven't learned any new big pieces. And yes, I have scheduled the Vidor Tagata for Easter this year. I haven't really put it on the rack yet, but uh, and I might cut out the middle section. Yeah, uh, uh, the, <laughs> having played it in a thousand times, uh, it, 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 it'll probably be all right. Um, yeah. The uh, but but no, with the limitations of the eighteen stop right. organ that I've got mm -hmm. now, I, there's lots of literature I can't play on that right. organ, and uh, I'm perfectly well, back. Sure uh, well, yeah, that's that's one thing, but it, you know what what stops to choose, and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. Lots of literature it just doesn't. Really. Right. Who is actually a piano major in college? But there's just so many things that he, he just he's right at I think he's about to turn 19. Um, there's so many things that he has to discover about his brain and what's going on in there. But I I coached him yeah practicing, but how to play hymns, what kinds of things to do about working with voices when they are singing and that sort of thing and urging him to get lots of experience singing in a chorus so that he understands what's going on. Uh, but the enticing thing to me about him is that he just sent me recently a four and a half minute composition for piano. I couldn't believe what I was seeing on the page. And he even made a recording on an iPhone. Mm -hmm of him playing the piece. Mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly play the piece. Absolutely. <laughs> While this hand is doing something else, it's just incredible. In his personality, do I see any of that going on? In his personality, no. But in the brain, mm -hmm. that is something down there taking... I think he's about to switch his major to be a double major in piano and composition. And composition. However... I do have him on the substitute list for this summer. He's going to be in town all summer long, so I've already booked him for f four Sundays. <laughs> and since my church owes me seven, seven or eight Sundays that I've not been, ever been able to take off. Sure it does. Um, so, uh, so I've been. I think it's just like teaching any organ student. Every one is different. There's no similarity between the two of you. Um, about how to play the organ. I mean, you've, you've had to go a different route in order to get to where you are and what you're doing um, because the brain is totally different. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, each individual has to be uh, a, find a way to express what's going on inside differently. Um, I don't know that I haven't had to lecture anything about what the future of a church organist is or why you should become one. I have some acquaintances here in town who will sometimes, on the subject of music, bring up subjects I have no idea what they're talking about uh, because they're out they're listening to something. If I hear it on the radio, I turn it off, and he goes, I have no interest whatsoever right. in, in something where uh, there's a drum repeating the same thing for 10 minutes in a row. It, it why, why, do I want to, why do I want to listen to something like that when I could be listening to something that has real quality to it? I mean, that's where my brain is, I and mean, maybe somebody else's brain is turned on by that sort of thing, but uh, I... I not been able to join. You, you don't ever stop. I have to tell myself that you know, frequently. Mm -hmm. Go practice. Uh, but like in the if Friday, I went in and I to the organ for about thirty minutes, and the secretary who knows nothing about the books and she said, "Why? Why do you have to practice? So you've been doing this so long. You you know it all by rote." And I thought, "No, no." Oh, uh, the. Uh, but she said, you weren't in there very long. And I said, well, but during Lent, I don't play any preludes or postludes. And I already know on the anthem, which is a cappella. So all I had to do was practice the hymns. 
And uh, <laughs> which I still have to but I still have to practice the yams. That's right. I'm right. And uh, mark what phrases have to be carried over and uh, and what a registration I'm going to change and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's really important, right? Just keeping keeping up practice. Keep keep keeping up going. Um, sorry, how did you phrase the question? No, just anything. Anything, this this is going on the Winthrop website, so a lot of former students will click on this. Are there any yeah. anything that you'd want to say to your students from over the years or any lack well, of lasting advice? Hey, I'm proud of you. If you're sticking with the profession and you're practicing and you're getting the job done, mm -hmm. I am very proud of you. Uh, and that's what I intended for you to, to do. Mm -hmm. um, keep it up. <laughs>